Great. Well, welcome, everybody. We'll get started. Other people will join as we go. Thank you for joining us today for our Deep Space Food Challenge webinar. We're very excited to have you here today, and we're very excited about having our panelists of astronauts and food experts, space food experts. Um, so real quick, let's talk about what we're going to do today. Next slide, please. So we're going to uh, welcome you to the webinar, go over a little bit of um, housekeeping, some rules. Uh, then we're going to remind you all of what the Deep Space Food Challenge is. Some of you have joined our first webinar where you got a detailed review of it. Um, but for those who have not, we'd like to give you an overview of what we're doing and why, um, in hopes that you will participate in and help us solve these important challenges. We'll then do some quick introductions of our esteemed panelists, um, followed by a interesting panel discussion, and then we will be able to open it up for questions and answers from the group. Next slide, please. Before we get started, this recording and transcript will be available on the challenge site, um, deepspacefoodchallenge.org. You can see that here. It'll also be made available in French on the Canadian website and Impact Canada. Um, and I actually forgot, I'm sorry, that this is being translated in French right now. So clearly, uh, um, maybe you can um, give them the input and apologies for forgetting that right at the beginning. Bonjour, bienvenue à tous et bienvenue au deuxième webinaire euh, du défi d'alimentation sur l'espace. Si vous voulez écouter le, le webinaire en français et que vous n'êtes pas encore branché au français, vous pouvez cliquer sur l'icône interprétation en bas de votre écran et choisir euh, français. Si vous êtes sur une tablette ou sur un téléphone, vous pouvez cliquer sur l'écran, appuyer sur plus, ensuite interprétation et enfin français. Et vous devriez être capable d'écouter et de suivre tout le webinaire en français. Merci beaucoup et bon webinaire. Thank you. Apologies to everybody for that. I was so excited about getting to our panelists that I forgot that important tidbit of um, the opportunity to listen to this in French. But that being said, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will put this recording and transcript on the website and it will also be available in French. During the presentation and during the panel discussion, you are able to ask questions of any of the panelists. Um, so please type that into the Q&A um, chat at the bottom. Specific questions about a proposed solution or a team's eligibility will not be answered uh, during our webinar today. However, any of those questions can be submitted if you are participating in the US challenge or the international challenge outside of Canada uh, uh, at the admin, uh, sorry, at the email address of admin at deepspacefoodchallenge.org and Canadian participants can um, email their uh, administrators also. Please be respectful of your questions and your conversations um, and your comments in the Q&A box. So before we dig in, we have a really great message from a friend of food space, Alton Brown. So let's hear what he has to say. Recipe, noun, a set of instructions for making or preparing something, especially a food dish. Sounds simple enough? Well, there's a lot more to it than just putting some ingredients together. Hi, this is Alton Brown. In order to successfully create a recipe, say a grilled cheese sandwich, you'll need some bread and cheese, of course, a refrigerator to keep the cheese fresh, a pan to cook it in, a source of energy to heat the pan, a knife to spread some butter, a spatula to flip it, spices scoured from the ends of the earth. You get the idea. And how about the food in our recipe? Where did you get it? How did it get there? Where did it come from? What sources were needed to grow it, produce it, package it, preserve it? It's a complicated and intricate network of processes to get a simple grilled cheese sandwich on the table. But earthbound humans have done a pretty good job of putting systems in place to get it all done. But what about spacebound humans? Difficulty and distance aside, astronauts on the International Space Station eat quite a healthy diet of fresh and freeze-dried foods thanks to semi-regular shipments originating from Earth. But to boldly go where no human has gone before, we'll need new and better ways to eat in space. Future astronauts on, say, a trip to Mars will spend years away from Earth, and that means no quick trips to the grocery store. They'll have to bring just about everything they'll need with them. Just like on Earth, 
When we prepare food in space, we need not only the food ingredients themselves, but we also need energy, water, and other materials to transform the ingredients into nutritional and tasty meals that astronauts will actually want to eat. So how do we reinvent food production systems so that they are sustainable and work in space? Well, that's where you come in. NASA and the Canadian Space Agency are launching competitions, the Deep Space Food Challenge. They're offering prize money for anyone who can come up with novel ways to keep our astronauts fed on future long-duration space exploration missions. What's really cool, aside from feeding interplanetary humans, is that these space-based food solutions could have transformative impacts on Earth's food systems, helping to resolve food insecurities and scarcities across our own planet. The Deep Space Food Challenge, pretty big stuff. Hopefully that inspired everybody um, and uh, made you want to participate. I'm now gonna hand this over to Angela. Angela is gonna be co-moderating with me today. She is the challenge manager for NASA's uh, Deep Space Food Challenge. She's gonna go over quickly a little bit about the challenge itself. Angela. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, and as Chris said, before we jump into our panel discussion, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the Deep Space Food Challenge and what has brought us all together today. So next slide, please. So as we look back at the history of space exploration, international collaborations have definitely been key. Uh, in the same way, the Deep Space Food Challenge is a collaborative effort between NASA and the Canadian Space Agency in support of space policies of both the United States government and the government of Canada. Our two agencies have come together to run parallel competitions around the important topic of food for the benefit of both space exploration missions and potential impacts here on Earth. And during the development process, NASA and CSA coordinated on the challenge design and agreed upon the challenge statement, goals, and assessment criteria. And when it comes to executing the challenge, NASA and CSA each manage their own rules document and applicant guide, the prize purse, and the eligibility criteria. And it's important to note here that CSA has no responsibility in the NASA-led challenge, and likewise, NASA has no responsibility in the CSA-led challenge. Next slide, please. So the goal of the Deep Space Food Challenge is to create novel food production technologies or systems that require minimal inputs and maximize safe, nutritious, and palatable food outputs for long-duration space missions and which also have potential to benefit people on Earth. So in phase one of the challenge, competitors are required to generate a robust design for a novel food production system. The NASA rules document and the CSA applicant guide outline the constraints and criteria for these designs. We're not looking for a larger food system that will fill every nutritional need of the crew, but rather pieces of an overall system that will significantly contribute to the comprehensive food system. So you can see below the key dates are shown here. For US and international teams, the deadline for registration closes on May 28th. And I will note here that registration is required for US and international teams. Um, it is not required for Canadian teams. So make sure you check the websites uh, as well to, to uh, see the details on the registration and the eligibility criteria. Um, submissions are due for all teams on July 30th and phase one winners will be announced in September of 2021. Next slide, please. So there are three tracks that teams can select to compete in. One is the NASA prize, which will award up to 500,000 US do dollars in a total prize purse to up to 20 top scoring teams that meet the eligibility criteria. The Canadian Space Agency will be awarding 300,000 Canadian dollars in grant funding with up to 10 teams each receiving $30,000 each and an invitation to be semi-finalists in the phase two of the challenge. And the teams that are competing for that must meet the unique eligibility requ requirements from the Canadian Space Agency as well. For those that do not meet the eligibility requirements of the NASA prize 
or the Canadian Space Agency Prize, there is a recognition prize that will recognize the top 10 international teams chosen by both NASA and CSA. Again, the specific eligibility requirements for each prize track can be found in the NASA rules document and the CSA applicant guide. Next slide, please. So I know that was a quick overview. So if you have any questions, um, Chris alluded to or showed you the uh, email addresses to reach out for questions and please feel free to use those as much and as often as you need to um, to get the answers on eligibility and how you can participate. Um, but for now, let's dive into the discussion and get right to the panelists. Uh, we're here to talk mainly about food and eating in space. So you'll hear about the history of how we've fed mission crews over the years, the research that's been done on the impact of nutrition on our crew, and how that research has fed into how we plan for missions. And we want to also talk about how innovation could impact food production for both future missions and for Earth. It's also important that we bring forward perspectives from the astronauts. The challenge documents detail the performance criteria that you listed that you see listed here, acceptability, safety, resource inputs and outputs, and reliability and stability. But it's one thing to read performance criteria on paper, and it's a completely different thing when you hear what those performance criteria mean from the end user. So we hope that this perspective from the astronauts proves valuable as you think about your designs and your solutions and approaches to this challenge. And now I will hand things back over to our moderator, Chris, to introduce the panel. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have five great panelists today. I'm going to quickly introduce them. I'm going to do a very short introduction and let them tell you a little bit more about themselves uh, when they are speaking. So first we have Grace, who serves as the lead scientist for NASA's advanced food technology research effort at NASA's Johnson Space Center. This effort focuses on determining methods, technologies, and requirements for developing safe, nutritious, and palatable food, uh, food systems that will promote astronaut health during long duration space missions. She will uh, really teach you that palatable is very important. Um, we all like good tasting food. Scott, leads to Nutritional Biochemistry Laboratory at the NASA Johnson Space Center, which is charged with keeping crews healthy on missions. Natalie is a project officer in operational space medicine at the Canadian Space Agency, or CSA. She has supported the provision of Canadian food on the International Space Station and served as the exercise specialist for CSA astronauts during ISS missions. Don is a former astronaut, scientist, professional speaker, educator and author of Orbit of Discovery about his STS-70 mission aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. He has spent 44 days in space and orbited the Earth nearly 700 times. And then Jeremy is one of two astronaut recruits selected by the Canadian Space Agency in May 2009 through the third Canadian astronaut recruitment campaign. He is one of 14 members of the 20th NASA astronaut class. While waiting for a flight assignment, he represents CSA at NASA and works at the Mission Control Center as a CAPCOM, the voice between the ground and the International Space Station. So I'm gonna ask all the panelists to please uh, turn on their video and I'm gonna ask Dane to pull down the slides so we could see everybody a little bit better. So let's dig right into this. So as a reminder for the panelists, if you do not mind, uh, if you could please also share uh, a little bit more about yourselves um, when you first answer your questions. That'd be very helpful for everybody out there. So Grace, we'd love to hear about your experiences developing the research path to ensure that future food systems meet crew health requirements um, on space flight vehicles. So why don't you why don't you jump in there? Yes, thank you. So uh, I work in the space food systems laboratory at the Johnson Space Center. And we, uh, our lab produces all the food that's used on the International Space Station right now. We're also working on how we're going to provide the food for crew on all of the upcoming Artemis missions. And then of course for exploration as we go and look on to a mission to Mars. And so one of the things that we need to make sure we're doing is determining what food systems could meet the goals of those missions. So in 
a research path to get to that food system, we need to consider what we're missing today. And our current prepackaged food system that we're using will not maintain nutrition and acceptability for the length of a Mars mission. So by the, when, when we think logistically of those missions, we have to launch food. Even now for the International Space, Space Station, we make the food ahead. We have to put it on the launch vehicle well ahead of launch and then launch it to space flight. And we have to have enough there for crew um, so that they have a reserve. And so this food gets to be months old, even on ISS, even a year old before they consume it. And that's going to become longer with long duration missions. So anything that goes on these missions, we we look at will likely need a five year shelf life. So any of the supplies, any of the foods, and our current food system does not meet that requirement at room temperature stability right now. So once you add in stuff like refrigeration, you're adding a lot of resources. So when we look at a research path, we don't know what the future food system will like will look like, and that's why we have all of you here today. And uh, we're what we need to do though is make sure that we're answering all of those questions. The questions: Is this acceptable? What are the resources, the inputs, the outputs that this is going to take? Because we're going to have really limited resources on these missions. What's the acceptability and the nutrition of this system? Because even if it is nutritious, if it's not acceptable, they're not going to eat enough. And it is really critical that they eat enough to support health and performance. They're going to be tasked at high levels on these missions. So we need them to eat the nutrition that they need. So um, we need to just make sure that in any system that we're looking at, we're answering all of those questions. And that's included in that research plan. Thank you. I, I was watching a video of yours from 2019, and you had a slide on there that um, said something like, right now we have 65 options for food and only seven of them will last for five years or so. I don't know if I have that statistic right, but maybe you can talk about the real need right there. So that was specific to um, some of our, uh, just a portion of our food system. We mm -hmm. looked specifically at our thermostabilized foods. So we have several kinds of prepackaged foods right now. We have the dehydrated foods um, that are freeze dried, that they rehydrate in space. We have thermostabilized foods, which are basically canned food in a pouch. And that was referring to those foods. Um, we did a shelf life test where we looked at a segment of those foods that was representative of all of them over uh, uh, multiple years. And we, based on the quality degradation and the nutritional degradation, um, we determined that only about seven of those foods, of those 65 canned foods would have made it to um, a seven or a five year shelf life. And so, uh, and, and so that does become a concern because if the food's not acceptable and it's not providing the nutrition, you're not going to have a healthy performing crew or a successful mission. Thank you. I, uh, it's, I, it's, you know, it's very important as, as you alluded to, to have multiple options there. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned palatability a, a few times. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass over to Don who has spent, um, 44 days in space and, and hear about his experiences with the food and, the, and not only the food at the taste of itself, the preparation of it. So Don, do you mind jumping in here? Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Uh, as we already said, uh, I spent about 44 days in space and during that time, I estimate I consumed about 125 space meals up there. Um, the food back then, the last time I flew in space was about 24 years ago. And back then it was mainly freeze dried food and a thermal stabilized that Grace has mentioned. Uh, it, was, it was okay. I never told people it was most delicious food in the world. And I frequently tell people I would never go to a restaurant that served space food. But you don't go to space for the food, you go for the view and for the adventure of it. Uh, and the food was okay. Uh, my favorite food, I, it was a beef and barbecue sauce that was thermal stabilized, a sweet and sour chicken. There was some really good freeze dried food as well. And uh, later on in the program, I was training for uh, ISS 6, Expedition 6. I didn't fly the mission, but I trained, spent a lot of time in Russia. And just bringing in some of the international food, some of the Russian food was was really good. And just to have a little more variety for, for us on board, uh, that made a great advancement. Excellent, thank you. Um, if you don't mind sharing, did you have any health implications? Did you lose any weight or um, you know, as a result of, of the food system situation? Yeah, I think there's only one person, one human that I know of in the history of human spaceflight that gained weight in space. That was Bill Shepard. And 
he was a maggot that his class name for his astronaut class was the maggots and he wanted to gain weight every other astronaut has lost weight maybe half a pound a few pounds in space i lost weight on each of my missions and and bill shepherd has that record he is the only astronaut to ever gain weight in space and i don't think there'll ever be an astronaut that's going to try to challenge him on, on that it's a, it's a world record that he's going to hold for the, the rest of the eternity. I think so. But, you know, <laughs> typically on a shuttle mission, they're two weeks long and you tend not to eat much the first day or two as you're adjusting to zero mm-hmm. gravity. It's going to be a lot different for these long duration missions. You know, after day two, they're adapted and then, you know, you're into your full appetite mode. Excellent. Well, thank you. So, so I'm going to pass this off to Scott. Scott, you know, um, one of the challenges always is the nutritional aspect of it, but then also the palatability. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your work and, and what you're really pushing for? And then we're going to turn to Natalie and ask her the same question. Uh, so just to tee you up, Natalie, um, uh, on, on that topic. Okay, well, I lead what's called the Nutritional Biochemistry Lab here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And it's a very different lab. It's in a different building in a different division than Brace's lab. Um, but nonetheless, our work is entwined. So her team is involved with coming up with a food system that crews will eat while they're up there. Our job is to determine the nutritional requirements for those foods. So we spend a lot of our time trying to make sure the crews are healthy, that they're going up there in good shape, good nutritional status, that they're eating well, that they're maintaining their body mass. Um, and that, from our perspective, um, is critical for crew health at the, at the top level. I was saying, you know, when you go to the doctor's office, the first thing they do is put you on a scale. And that's because your body mass is a very good index of your overall health. And we do the same thing during space flight. Um, I wouldn't shout out individual crew data, but since Don did, um, Bill Shepard maintained his weight. He did a great job. Um, he's not alone. He may be one of the few that gain weight. Um, but I've heard flight surgeons say that it's very obvious that people that maintain their weight better come off the vehicle better. I mean, when they land back on Earth, either when they used to land in the shuttle or when they bounce down in Kazakhstan, um, the people that, that maintain their weight, their muscles are better off, the bones are better off, the cardiovascular system is better off. And a lot of that is simply based on good nutrition and good exercise. Um, we we do operational work to keep crews healthy to assess their nutritional status. We also do research trying to understand how the body changes during flight and how nutrition can be used to mitigate some of the negative effects of space flight. We've recently published our 30th paper from space station findings, um, and we've got a, a wide breadth of work, everything from showing the crews that ate more fish, lost less bone, and we think that's related to omega-3 fatty acids. Crews that eat more fruits and vegetables tend to lose less bone. Uh, we think related to acid-base balance. And we've got some very exciting data related to what I would call personalized nutrition, where genetic influences seem to predispose some astronauts to developing eye problems. And those eye problems, they are the underpinning is in B vitamins, things like folate and vitamin B12. And we're doing ground-based studies now to look at whether or not we could supplement those individuals with vitamins to stop those vision problems. So that, in a very short order, gives you a big picture of the type of work that we do. Great. Thank you. I'm going to pass this off to Natalie uh, to answer a similar question about nutrition. And and maybe you can help us understand what is your, the biggest challenge with nutrition um, in space, Natalie? Thank you, Chris, and greetings, everyone. So I um, coordinate nutrition and exercise support at the Canadian Space Agency. Um, I work very closely with um, Scott and Grace and their labs um, to ensure that we're providing the nutritional support that CSA astronauts need. Um, So we rely on um, the expertise of Scott and his team for looking at nutritional status of our astronauts. Um, And then we provide Canadian food to supplement the standard ISS menu um, that's available on on station. Um, I think in terms of challenges for nutrition, um, we're starting to see a a good variety of food on orbit. Um, One of the reasons that we provide Canadian food is that it just um, increases that variety and encourages our astronauts to meet the um, energy requirements that they have. Um, So I think variety is a 
we're definitely meeting it now with space station, but as we go further afield, I think that is going to be a challenge because we want to keep that variety uh, in the menu to ensure that the crews do continue to meet their energy requirements. And when we start looking at um, exercise countermeasures, exercise is one of the uh, key countermeasures that we use for preventing uh, some of the negative changes that, well, I shouldn't say preventing, for mitigating some of the negative changes that occur on um, in space flight. And nutrition is a very important component of um, ensuring that astronauts can uh, perform these exercise countermeasures. They need to have the adequate uh, energy, but also the um, micronutrients as well to make, make sure that they can maintain their health while, while they perform uh, exercise countermeasures. Excellent, uh, thank you. I wanna pass this off to Jeremy. Jeremy, um, as you're training, what are you most and least excited about and what are you learning from the astronauts you're in touch with on the International Space Station as it relates to preparing their food and eating their food and the taste of their food? Yeah, well, thanks, Chris. Um, greetings, everyone. Great to join you today. I, uh, I'm an astronaut at Space Agency and uh, I've been training and preparing to go for space for some I haven't flown in space, so unlike Don, I haven't en enjoyed any of my meals in space yet, but I have been um, having meals in some really bizarre and interesting places as I prepare to go to space, such as uh, Nemo missions where we live under the ocean and basically in a habitat on the ocean floor for a week as a crew. Same thing, we did a caving expedition with the uh, ESA organization. I've been up in the Canadian Arctic um, studying geology and meteor craters there. Had some interesting meals. Um, also, as a fighter pilot, been in some survival situations for training purposes, not for real, but training purposes where um, I've had another perspective on food. And I think one of the things I wanted to share with you today, and Don kind of alluded to it, is that, you know, I kind of view food in different categories. So, you know, there's some times where you're just trying to survive. And it doesn't really matter what the food tastes like. You're just happy to have food and have food security and feel like you're going to survive. That's really important. And then there are other times where you're just so busy, you have so much going on, you're just eating to get by. It's almost like one more job you got to do. You want it to be quick. You want it to be easy. And you want to be able to get the nutrients that, uh, that Natalie was talking about so you can perform. Um, and that, you know, that's a different category. And then, then there's a third category that we don't always often have. Um, but you saw some of it in the video there is where you're enjoying your food for pleasure and community. In fact, um, I think you might find it interesting, but we, we spend a lot more time these days in astronaut training talking about team skills. And that's because as we go on longer duration missions, we, we need to really work on our communication as a team. And just like a family sits around a dinner table and has a conversation at night, we encourage our astronaut corps to, to carve out time, you know, maybe not every night, but if you could every night around the dinner table on the space station and have a community meal and, and bring out some discussions about the things that are making the team great and some things that the team could improve on. And food actually becomes a big part of that. And to be enjoying that food, preparing it as a community and sharing food, that's a completely different experience. And, you know, I don't know what, as we explore and, and try to provide food on the moon and Mars, you know, how able we're going to be to have that experience, but that's something to keep in mind. So I kind of gave you three things like survival, just getting the job done and enjoying food are three things to think about. Um, in, you know, you asked about training, Chris, um, you know, we, I've had the opportunity to try a lot of this food and, you know, taste testings of the food and had space food um, that Grace was talking about in a number of our training events and, and, I, you know, there's just so much variety. And I, I look back at my notes and my, from my taste testing, I, there's a lot of meals out there. There's more than 160, it looks like, from the notes I looked at. And I've got, you know, eights and nines out of 10. Um, well, it's actually the scales out of nine, eight and nines for a number of different foods. So I feel like uh, we're in good shape. But I know I just wanted to add one more thing on the, on the heel of my introduction here is I'm actually particularly excited about all of you that are joining this challenge. I think you have an opportunity to do something absolutely incredible for humanity. One, you're going to enable us to explore. That's awesome. And everybody on this, on this Zoom or on this uh, video con loves that. But in addition to that, the benefits you can bring to humanity on the planet right now are potentially huge. 
And like just as one example in Canada, we're talking a lot about food security in remote regions in the Canadian North. Um, and with climate change, we're seeing traditional food sources are changing, putting food pressures on communities, places where transportation is really either really expensive or prohibitive. And so anything we can do to come up with novel ways to provide food security in space could really help us on the planet. So my hat is off to all of you for joining in this challenge. Thank you. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to throw a question out there to anybody, and, and maybe it's a little controversial, but uh, we're doing challenges, so there's there's as much um, challenge uh, competition as there is and and collaboration. But what's the word on the street of who has the best food, whether food you've actually eaten or that any of you know that you've done the nutritional analysis on? But but what country is known to have the best space food? Oh, nobody wants to answer. Well, I, I won't answer that, but you've heard it before with, the, with some of the comments. What most most crews tell us, and not all crews come back and say that the biggest challenge was variety. That on a six-month space station mission, when you're, you're, the package of foods or the set of foods you have available to you repeats every eight days, that, that gets, it doesn't matter how good the food is or bad the food is, it's still, you're seeing it every eight days. And anything to increase variety um, adds to that. So if for a couple of days they had some Canadian food or for a couple of days they had some Japanese food, um, I think crews will automatically tell you that that was the best stuff because it was new. When we look back on the, the Russian space station Mir that we flew US crew members to back in the 90s, when their cargo vehicles would come up, they would load in things like tomatoes and onions and uh, some citrus fruit. And Shannon Lucid talked about one time when they opened up the vehicle that she took a raw onion and took a bite out of it. And that, that was the best thing she'd had in the longest time because it was crisp. So I don't know if an onion is the best food there, but again, it's it's all in your perspective. That's fair. Anybody else want to jump in? I think yeah. there's a little oh, go ahead, Grace. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was going to add to that, you know, that I find a big challenge, you know, working in the food lab is that, as Scott mentioned, variety and the fresh foods, a lot of fruits and vegetables that we eat on earth tend to be fresh foods. And so the challenge is we have to provide those foods in a way that's acceptable, mostly in a processed form, so that they're shelf stable for months at room temperature right now on the International Space Station. And that's still the plan for some of the upcoming missions. Refrigeration is at a premium. There's a lot of resources involved in that. And we get the comment, you know, is not space cold? Well, it depends on the orientation to the sun. You know, if you were going to use the cold of space, you would still need a lot of resources to provide infrastructure for that and protection from vacuum. And whether that's better than using a real, you know, refrigerator or not is still unknown. But when you're looking at the variety, you know, we we'll have uh, comments. Well, I don't eat a lot of food myself. You know, I only eat, you know, you know, ten things in a day, and I repeat it. Um, the big challenge too is you have a wide group of people and you don't always know who's going to be flying. And so we try to provide common foods that are commonly acceptable. And that's still a challenge because if you look at what you eat and then even what your family eats, it tends to be widely different and what might overlap is not often the same thing. So when we're packing for these vehicles, you know, you, you, you see the same menus and, and things like that. But if we were to increase variety, it would decrease what is available still because we're in a restricted system. We're in a limited system. And so right now, let's say we have a two or three packages of one kind of food. If you were going to provide more packages um, of something different, you have to limit what's there. So if somebody really likes broccoli, you might have three of that in that eight day period. And if you have three crew eating that, they might each get it once. And so if you, um, want to provide more variety, then you might see broccoli once for a crew member in eight days. And so there's where the challenge comes in. How do we provide the common foods in a way that's acceptable? How do we provide the variety in a way that's acceptable? And how do we provide these fresh foods in a way that's acceptable within these limited resources um, and, and in this closed system? So I think that's one of the challenges 
that we're hoping to solve here. Thank you. Don, did you want to jump in? Yeah, Chris, just to answer the question, like what country has the best food that you answer? There's a lot of cultural bias in that, and you tend to align you know, your food preferences with your culture. So I love the NASA food. I thought that was really good, but I did enjoy a lot of the Russian food. So, you know, I just brought additional variety, you know, to your menu up there, which is a great thing as everybody's mentioned. Excellent. Well, I mean, Grace, I mean, the easiest way to solve this problem is to only send my daughter's second grade class because all they eat is pasta with butter. As long as Parmesan cheese is acceptable in space and doesn't ruin anything, I think, I think we can solve our long-term mission problems with just a bunch of eight-year-olds. So um, kind of looking, looking ahead, um, well, actually, Grace, I'm going to turn back to you real quick. What do you see as the current biggest challenge that, that we've learned from the past that we need to apply to the future um, in terms of our food systems? And then we're going to jump ahead and talk about what's probably really interesting to the, the group listening who want to participate. What are we expecting, right? Yeah, and I definitely think it's it's making sure that we have variety and choice, even within that limited system, because, um, you know, we also get the comment, can we provide vitamins if the nutrients are degrading? Well, you know, vitamins could have roles for certain things, but there's thousands of phytochemicals in whole foods, and you want to provide choice within that. If you tell somebody you have to eat this one thing every day to get that nutrient, and that person doesn't want to eat that, especially over time, that's going to become really challenging and something that, you know, becomes a psychological thing that they abhor doing. So, um, you know, when we look at food, we know that as the missions get longer, food is becoming more important in isolation and confinement and being able to gather for those meals and enjoy them um, becomes important for, uh, you know, just crew camaraderie and and having that opportunity familiar so providing familiar acceptable foods becomes more important as these missions and also more challenging as these missions get longer so i think you know from history from is you know shuttle to iss missions that got longer we learned we didn't have enough choices and so we had to provide more choices so crew could find something they wanted to eat. Providing exactly the number of calories that we need for a mission is not a good way to go. We need to provide more than that so that there is choice there. Thank you. And I'm gonna to turn to Natalie and Scott, just from your perspective, from the nutrition perspective, what do you see as the biggest challenges that we have to address um, moving forward for longer term missions? Um, I, th I think we've uh, sort of covered it a bit in the variety aspect and that we want uh, to ensure that crew are getting a adequate energy and also adequate um, macro and micronutrients. Um, and so the way to do that is really to ensure that they're eating enough and you have a, a good variety of food. So um, that, that will continue to be a challenge uh, as we go forward. Great. Scott, anything to add there? Yeah, my dog's getting excited, so um, I'll just talk quick. Um, yeah, as Natalie said, when I talk to astronauts, the first thing I tell them is the biggest thing is you got to eat. You got to get calories, and you got to maintain your weight. Beyond that, you tend to look at macronutrients, um, and then you start to look into micronutrients. As we look beyond low Earth orbit, we're going to have a much higher radiation profile. We're going to have a greater oxidative stress profile. And we're going to start to look at, as Grace talked about, um, foods with more vegetables, more phytochemicals, the things that we don't really understand um, how they help cure cancer, for instance. Now, we know that, you know, everybody's always looking for the vitamin that's going to cure cancer, and we haven't found it yet. But we know people that eat more broccoli and eat more cauliflower and more cruciferous vegetables have a lower incidence of cancer. So figuring out how to, how to adapt the food system so that we can optimize it so that we're flying a very healthy food system that the crews will eat um, is going to be absolutely critical as we leave lower form. Thank you. And, um, and Don and Jeremy, just from the standpoint of um, being the one up there that has 18,000 things to do on a given day, um, what are the biggest challenges that, that astronauts face in either preparing or eating or 
whatever it is, food and afterthought, is food something you focus on all day long? Would love your thoughts there. I'll start off. You know, on the space shuttle, they would give us about an hour for lunch, breakfast, you know, dinner, hour break there. And that was time to collect your food, prepare it, and then enjoy a, a meal together. So it was really a rushed event, but uh, it was a really a great treat. Everybody looked forward to that, you know, every day up there. So, you know, food became really important, even on a, a short 16 day mission. Um, but it didn't consume a lot of our day. The food was very easy to prepare. You know, you add water to the freeze-dried food, the thermal stabilized, we throw it in a little, you know, convection oven to heat it up a little bit. So it was really simple to prepare. Um, we mainly wanted to get our food and then go to the window and watch the earth go by. Just like many Americans watch TV during their dinner. I don't do that, but I've heard some Americans do that. In space, you just want to grab your food and go to the window and watch the world outside is it was there one window that was better than the others uh it just depends on which way the shuttle was oriented yep. and we had two big windows two overhead windows mm -hmm. in the space shuttle and everybody would just be uh you know looking out of those two and, and it was like you know you're sharing a, a lunch together we would be sharing the views like mm -hmm. maybe watching a movie together eating a meal something like that where our view was was just a planet earth I love it. Jeremy, anything to add? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, Don's missions were, you know, high, highly choreographed uh, timelines, really, really busy missions from, from beginning to end on a space shuttle. And then ISS, you have, you know, this huge span of time. Now we've gotten really good at flying more and more science. So we're keeping the astronauts really busy on board the International Space Station, but obviously they have more time over that six month duration than, than Don would have had on a mission to, you know, at least some of the time enjoy food. So, you know, to answer your Chris or your question, Chris, is that it really depends. Like some days you're, you're just trying to get food in. I think, I mean, I haven't lived this yet, but just the experience of experiences I've had on earth, some days you're just trying to get food done. Um, so you can, you can have nutrition and then other days you're kind of looking for that experience. And, you know, I would, or just for people to put in the back of their minds as we explore, we don't necessarily have as many utilization tasks initially as we explore further. You know, the challenge is just getting there, surviving, getting your spacecraft back, or landing on the moon for the first time. Um, and so initially, we may have long gaps of, of time where astronauts do have the time to prepare some food or enjoy a meal or have some form of preparation, but you wouldn't want to count on that all the time. And I, I noticed one of the comment or one of the questions was, you know, does the astronaut's palate change in space essentially? And uh, the answer to that, Don, you're better positioned to answer than me, but all my colleagues have told me that, yeah, the answer is yes, because you may have noticed that when astronauts fly, their, their faces become a little bit puffier and that's because of the lack of gravity. A lot of our blood resides down in our core, our torso, and in space, it, it just naturally redistributes more evenly. And so your head is puffier and it's kind of like having a cold with respect to losing some of your taste. And so everybody warns rookie flyers that you're going to probably want more spice than you're used to. And so a lot of people are flying hot sauces or wasabi paste or, and things like that just to get that variety and to like have something that they can really taste uh, because the food does become more bland in space. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask one last question to everybody and I'm gonna ask you to answer it in 15 seconds or less. Um, and then we're gonna open it up to the, the questions that came in through the Q&A. And the way that will work is Angela has been um, moderating that and she will jump back in and start asking those questions. But last question before we open it up, is uh, what is the one thing as people are participating in this challenge or planning to participate in this challenge that you think is important for them to know, the most important thing for them to take into consideration from your perspective? So whoever wants to jump in first. Sure. I'll go first. Right, go. You first, sure. Jeremy. Okay. Um, you know, there's so many different aspects of this and I, I see you know, a lot of focus on the prepared foods that we fly 
But from my perspective, what I'm most excited about is how do we as a species produce food in space or on the moon or on Mars? I'm really, really fascinated by, you know, somebody who can break the mold on this. And maybe it's, it's somewhat, it can be as conventional as it was before, but you got to think about the energy constraints. And there's just a lot there for you to dig into. Thank you. Go for it, Scott. I'd say that to be nutritious, the food has to be eaten. So no matter how fancy or, or rich the food is, um, it's got to be palatable, it's got to be interesting, it's got to get eaten. And you got to keep those two things together. Great. Thank you. Why don't we go to Grace? So the process um, can be just as important as the final product for acceptability. So uh, if you think about an exploration mission versus where we start having human settlement and food specialists, um, an exploration mission probably won't have food specialists. So what are you willing to do in your kitchen at home, especially after a long day of work? So whatever um, solutions you're thinking of, how could you make that something people would want to do at, at their homes? Great, why don't we go to Natalie? I think just to um, add a different aspect to what um, the previous panel panelists have said, um, we also need something that's reliable. So especially as we go further and further away from earth and the crews are really self-reliant, we need to make sure that we've got a robust system. Uh, so reliability will be very important. And then Don, why don't you take us home and I'm gonna pass it over to Angela. Okay, you know, I kind of object to the word palatable Palatable means it's like edible and lima beans are edible, but I'm not going to eat them in space. So what I would like to inject in there, make sure from the astronaut perspective that the food is delicious, that it's something that's going to please me, make me psychologically feel better when I'm up in space. And if I'm going to enjoy it, it'll help with the nutrition. It's going to help overall with the well-being of the astronaut. Thank you. So, so we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to pass this over to Angela to uh, share some of the questions that we received in the chat. Hey, can I jump in real quick? Of course. I, I just want to echo Dom's comment. He said, you're absolutely right. The, but that hits in another issue that we have. Because, Don, you won't eat the lima beans, but there's going to be a crew member coming after you who loves them. And how do you, how do you balance that out? And that's, that's what makes Grace's job really, really hard. And we've had that on orbit. We've had one crew say, look, We've got tons of packages of grits up here. Can we throw them out? And the next crew said, no, don't throw them out. I'll eat them when I get there. And that, again, it just, it, it, the more you dig into this, you realize just how hard this is. Great. Thank you for that. Angela, you want to take over? Sure. So um, that was a great, great discussion. You've all actually answered a lot of the questions that have come in. So this is, this is great. Um, I've highlighted a few. Uh, we've had a, many come in. Uh, so the first one I'm going to start with is uh, what do the astronauts say they struggle the most the most with with the space food? Is it taste? Is it texture, smell, variety? What really kind of hit you that was difficult to overcome as far as acceptability with the food? And I'll hand that either to Jeremy or Don, or I'd like you both to answer. I'll start off, and I think you hit on a number of the issues. Jeremy mentioned, you know, the food is a little bland up there, so do you like it to be a little spicier? Uh, consistency also changes. You know, shrimp cocktail is one of the most popular items in the shuttle program, and that's because it's a little bit spicy with the cocktail sauce, and it had a really good consistency. You could just close your eyes and eat a shrimp cocktail in space, and you might not know the difference, you know, between eating that one and one at your favorite restaurant. Where some of the other foods, I, I like the freeze-dried strawberries. I love them in space. Their consistency, they were soft and mushy. It wasn't like a fresh, crisp strawberry I would eat here on Earth, but it had great taste. And the aroma, when I would cut the package open, I would just smell strawberries. And so it was kind of a trade-off between maybe consistency, the flavor uh, that you want, and some aroma to that as well. Yeah, you're just having, you know, eaten a lot of the space food on the ground, I agree a lot with what Don said. And then I'd add in, you know, there's just some things that are missing, like we avoid foods that create crumbs. We just don't fly them. 
Um, like for example, regular bread, you know, you can imagine if you pulled out a slice of bread and went to put some butter on it, you just you have breadcrumbs floating all over the place or chips. You know, if you opened up a bag of chips, you have chip crumbs floating all over the place. And so we avoid a lot of those things. And so some of the consistencies or some of the staples you might be used to augmenting your diet with, they're just not available. Great, thank you. And then, so to tack on of uh, onto that a little bit, um, someone uh, submitted a question that said, "Nutrition and eating starts with your eyes. So, what the food looks like really feeds into if you want to eat it. So, how do the meals look? Uh, do you see them when you're eating them, or is it in a solid package? And how does that affect how you consume them?" So, I think, oh, go ahead. yeah, I was just going um, to mention that they are in solid packages and a lot of the reason for that is shelf life. So those solid packages have a layer that protects them from um, moisture and oxygen and gives them a longer shelf life, which we definitely need as we get further um, into space flights. So, and they are all processed to this point. So that's a very valid point um, that we, we do try to add in you know, a lot of different ingredients, colors, things like that, both for nutrition and to improve uh, the way the foods look and acceptability. So that's, I'll stop there. And from a, the freeze-dried food, you know, it looked horrible. You know, it doesn't look appetizing, but you know, once you add the water, you know, the consistency will get better. You're going to get that aroma from it. So over, overall, I would say space food doesn't look appetizing. So I don't think it starts with the, with your eye, with the vision of the food and space. It's more maybe uh, in your mind of what it's gonna taste like or what smell, what it's gonna smell like when you open the package. Great, thank you. Um, so Jeremy, I'm gonna pass this one to you. Um, someone made mention of, uh, you know, there being crossover between providing um, the same type of prepackaged meals to like troops. And so I'm curious, could you speak to, um, you know, what was the food like on the Nemo mission or um, when you were on other missions? Does that, how does that compare to the food they're prepping for space? And is there crossover there as far as the technology is concerned and what, what can be kind of enhanced? Yeah, I'll give you my perspective on it. And then, uh, you know, maybe Scott or Grace can correct me if I stray uh, afield, but the, you know, in, in addition to the foods that are supplied by NASA and the other international partners, we do have the ability to um, select for some, from some off the shelf foods to augment our diet and take the space with us or to take on these missions. So um, I've, utilized uh, some of this the standard camping foods that uh, that we you know that you would go into uh, an REI or mountain equipment co-op and buy and take camping and rehydrate um, I've used some of those some other non-perishable type foods on missions um, so I think there is crossover some of the some of the foods in our system if I'm not mistaken grace uh, are are the same as the military MRE rations uh, if that is that correct yeah, so we have some of those. So there's definitely some crossover in the technologies for preserving those foods and having shelf life and the simplicity of, of um, access and preparation are very useful in a military environment, obviously. Great, thank you. Um, oh, Grace, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I can add to that, that we do use um, some military foods um, the reason we don't use the entire military system is because those foods tend to be really, really high in sodium. And we are trying, you know, when you're eating a completely prepackaged menu for these amounts of times, um, it's challenging. Sodium tastes really good. And so we need to try to make sure that we're also maintaining um, adequate sodium levels and not excessive sodium levels. And so a lot of our foods that we have developed have been to reduce that sodium content. It does have other impacts in spaceflight too. 
Great. So I'm going to wrap up with this one last question. Unfortunately, we are very close to the end of our time and there are a lot of qu great questions coming in. Um, but here's the last one. Uh, when thinking about uh, the foods that you're providing uh, to the astronauts in a closed space, are there any foods like beans or Brussels sprouts or cabbage, um, kimichi, onions, things like that, that are no-nos because they do have kind of other physical implications or is that different when you're in space? Mm -hmm. And so I guess, um, yep, please, Jeremy. Well, one thought comes to mind that I've learned from my colleagues is that there have been some fish meals that uh, really um, and just had a strong, strong odor once you open it up and it would just be pervasive throughout the, the module. And so that, that was frowned upon to, uh, to open up some. So you have to think about you know, the smell. That's one of the things. And then Natalie or Scott, any thoughts there? I'll say that the food system is actually pretty high in fiber. So the answer to the question directly, no, there's no limitations on any specific food item. And I might just add, uh, you know, you might talk it over with your crew members as well. If you knew somebody didn't like fish or like the smell of that, then you would tend to avoid those if you could, or you eat that in a another module somewhere to stay out of the way of that, just being considerate of your crew members. That is a great point. Okay, um, so that is the wrap up for the Q&A right now. Um, I'm gonna give Dana a second to uh, pull up the slides again. So uh, thank you so much to our panelists. This was a great discussion. Um, there are many, many questions that came in. Uh, so we will be working with the panelists to um, fill in answers for a lot of these questions and, and post them on the websites afterwards. Um, so just again, a reminder um, that the websites will have the recordings available, including the French version. Um, and you'll be able to find those on um, both the Impact Canada website and the um, deepspacefoodchallenge.org website as well. Um, I'm gonna hand it back over to Chris uh, to wrap us up and go through the rest of this information. But thank you again to the panelists. This was, this was great. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And thank you to all of our panelists. What a fun discussion. Um, apologies that we couldn't get to all of the questions. Uh, but what are our next steps? So we would love for all of you to participate in any of these challenges, whether the, the US based one, the international outside of Canada and the US based one, or the Canadian based one. Um, so please uh, feel free to go to the website, learn about what these are, and start submitting your solutions. Um, if you go to deep, food face, deep space food challenge.org, you'll be able to stay in the loop, getting email updates, et cetera. And we have a LinkedIn group to continue these conversations. So if you go to what's on this, uh, this um, slide, you'll be able to get there. Um, this will be, as Angela said, this will be updated. I'm uh, sorry, this will be posted. Our previous one is already posted, the one that was more about the rules and eligibility. Um, and for Canadians, uh, look out for a networking session on March 23rd, and more information on that will be on the Impact Canada website. So thank you for your time. We hope everybody enjoyed the conversation, and we really hope to see lots of solutions that could help us solve our challenges in space, but also be relevant to our challenges on Earth. Thank you. <laughs>